thank you very much for coming today and we have been for the last week or so celebrating Ganesh Chaturthi. So today I'll speak about four life lessons as you can see in the title. These will all be in terms of four R's. So it's a easy mnemonic for you to remember and take it forward. Across the world, when people have faced problems in life and everybody faces problems in life. I have spoken across different across the world from Australia to America and spoken to people from different denominations, from different belief systems, including non-believers. And we may have many disagreements. But there's one thing we all can agree on. And that is life is tough. <laughs> even the wealthiest persons, even the most popular persons, they won't say life is easy. In fact, sometimes the more wealth and popularity we get, sometimes that makes our life tougher. So when life becomes tough, across history and geography, people have sought meaning that will make the toughness bearable. We are inherently meaning-seeking creatures. Nobody likes problems, sufferings, pains. But what we especially detest is meaningless suffering, pointless pain. If we can have a worldview that can help us see our pain and suffering and problems, the overall toughness of life, as meaningful, then that can empower us. And that was a great source of strength for people in generations prior to ours. In our modern times, we have focused a lot on the study of matter. And the science and technology that we have developed has few parallels in recent recorded modern history, at least. However, while studying matter, we have lost meaning. There is a study of matter, which is science. And there is a study of what matters. And that is spirituality. The study of matter and the study of what matters. And it is the study of what matters that can actually bring meaning in our life. And that meaning can help us to face life's inevitable challenges. So when we celebrate festivals like Ganesh Chaturthi, it's not just about eating modak or doing some puja or just maybe having some deity in our homes for a few days. All these are fine as cultural practices, but there's something much more. The the stories about Lord Ganesh are not just stories for childhood entertainment. These stories are stories that have been preserved for thousands of years. And if people have preserved these stories for thousands of years, they must have found something meaningful in those stories. And what was the meaning? For that, we need to look at the tradition from the perspective of the tradition. If we look at it from outside perspective, then we may miss out on what was valuable for the tradition, for those who are following the tradition. So from that perspective, we are looking at this, you know, we look at four primary stories from Lord Ganesh's life, or motives from his life, and we'll see what we can learn from them. So the first is, Right, if a beginning is reconciliation. It's happening here. Okay. So we know his birth itself is traumatic. The story of his birth is that when Parvati was in Kailash and she wanted to bathe in privacy, and Lord Shiva at that time gone out for his responsibilities. And she, in order to have her privacy created by her mystic power, an effigy and infused life into it. And that, it was her creation, it was like her son. 
and he told her to guard the place where she was bathing now it was uh, when lord shiva came back this this creature who is a strange creature what is he doing in my house and why is he stopping me from visiting my own family and now ganesh didn't know that this is his his father and shiva didn't know that this was his son and thus there was a confrontation ganesh said who are you stopping me from so she was said who are you stopping me who are you coming in and that seemed to escalate to a fight and the fight became so fierce that eventually lord shiva had to use his full prowess and he beheaded ganesh now at one level you may say this is a trivial thing why do they get fight when they fight to such an extent that one has to kill another person but if you look at the history of the world this is how fights grow sometimes small fights begin begin become big it was due to misunderstanding that are unresolved and this reveals a reality that ganesh's intention was good he was simply carrying out the instruction of his mother but good intentions doesn't mean that there'll always be good results sometimes misunderstandings happen even because of good intentions despite our good intentions but then does that mean there's no use of good intentions no good intentions may not prevent conflicts but they can prevent the escalation of conflicts so eventually when parvati came back and she saw her beheaded creation was what have you done she was a gas she was infuriated she was devastated and seeing her her emotionally brought state the deities brahma shiva they all get, what can we do and then shiva realized he had made a serious mistake so he decided that we have to i have to make amends and he said i don't have the power to bring life back but i can transfer life so then he sent his followers and then they found an elephant and they he got an elephant's head and he placed on ganesh his head had been beheaded and destroyed he said he had been beheaded his head had been destroyed and then ganesh just became the elephant god and here sometimes the abilities and the arenas the specific activities may seem supernatural may seem fantastical to us but in the world itself we see different people have different abilities now some people have such outstanding memories some people have photographic memories some people have eidetic memories for others it just seems like a miracle how can you do that so these abilities are just a difference in degree rather than fixating on how it is possible or not possible we focus on what is valuable in this that even the gods even beings far more powerful than us face dilemmas similar to ours they have aspirations similar to ours and they make choices which have consequences but how do they reconcile how do they resolve that is what we learn from this so what happens is once he is revived now ganesh never holds it against his father never holds it you know it's it's quite traumatic for someone to to be attacked by their own father what to speak of not just attacked but killed by one's own father now there is no description uh, as far as i have read that there was some mystical wiping out of ganesh's memory he, that he didn't remember that it was the shiva who killed him but the point is he didn't hold it against him so if we maintain good intentions what happens is there may be misunderstandings and when there is a misunderstanding and other act in a way that is hurtful for towards us we have a choice whether we resent their actions or we maintain our good intentions we can't change the past but we can change how the past influences our present and although his birth was from a trauma he did not let that trauma scar him and nowadays many people have psychologically scarred because of their upbringing or because of their childhood or because of certain experiences and yes it's difficult but our past may affect our present but it doesn't have to determine our present and we can't change our past but we can as i said 
we can change how our past influences us and that is how do we do that by maintaining positive intentions so ganesh was or ganesh was serving his mother and his attitude was an attitude of service by maintaining that attitude of service he was able to put the past in the past so in the bhagavad gita so i'll correlate each of these teachings which we are talking about with a verse from the bhagavad gita after all the lord ganesh who himself transcribed the mahabharat that will be the story i'll discuss at last and in that mahabharat there is the bhagavad gita and the bhagavad gita had said what is the best way to conduct our lives how can we conduct our lives in such a way that we can endear ourselves to each other and we can endear ourselves to the divine the gita says that yasmano dvijate loko lokano dvijate cha yah harsha marsh bhayo dvegai mukto yah sacha me priya says that yasmano dvijate loko don't be agitated by the action of others people have a lot of things going on in their own heads and sometimes when they act hurtfully towards us it is not it many times it is not because of us it is because of some drama going on in their head and we just happen to be extras in that drama we happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time we can say so don't be agitated by others and conversely a smart no dujate loko and we don't agitate others we focus on the purpose of our life and continue the purpose of our life uh, you did this to me so i will do this to you now when we when we try to get even with others we end up getting at odds with ourselves <laughs> we get end up with odds with ourselves getting at odds with ourselves means we become deviated from what is important in our own life so don't agitate others don't be agitated by others maintain an attitude of service focus on our purpose that's the lesson which lord ganesh is right from his life itself then there is a famous story of when ganesh and kartikeya were siblings and siblings always have a friendly rivalry among them so who is better so now kartikeya was relatively fitter ganesh was a little chubby so kartikeya decided that you know let's have a competition in which i will win so let's circumambulate the world so okay and both of them started kartikeya just started racing as fast as he could and ganesh was very calmly went to the place where his parents were there he circumambulated his parents they went to the command three times he went around three times and he sat down peacefully and kartikeya was huffing and puffing and he came back and what happened he said you didn't even try he said no i tried i already won said, what how so he said my parents are my world for me and by circumambulating them i have circumambulated the whole world so now this kind of seem a cute story or it might seem a simple moral story talks about how we should respect our parents yes it is but it is much more what it shows is that actually the world of relationships matters much more than the world of achievements that we live in a world we live in a social culture where often we overvalue achievements and we devalue relationships but at the end of the day we what really matters for us if somebody has 10000 facebook friends and not even one real friend you know it's not going to be of much help we need to connect deeply with people not just be known widely if we can get achievements that's fine but what we have to put first things first but the pressure of the world is such that we end up chasing glamour and fame and recognition in the world and we seek achievements to impress the world would you mind all moving this side please because there will be more students coming in it would be really helpful that way you create space yeah. for those who are coming thank you so much we are all vegetarian so nobody is going to eat you <laughs> <laughs> so mm-hmm. 
the nature of the world is peer pressure comes on us and because of that we let our priorities be determined by the world and if we want quality relationships we need quality time i saw one cartoon where a person is saying a man was talking with his friend yesterday my broadband internet went down so i came out of my room and spent some time with my family <laughs> they seem like nice people <laughs> so what happens is we may be more concerned about what is happening in chile than what is happening with our own children <laughs> we may consider more about what is happening in serbia than what is happening with our own spouse or our own siblings so our priorities can get distorted and we seek to know more about the latest breaking news so that we can appear very knowledgeable then okay it's good to be aware of current affairs but it's much more important to be aware of the currents of thoughts and emotions that are going on in the hearts of our loved ones they're going on in the minds of those people who are important for us so relationships matter much more than achievements and so kartikeya was focused now kartikeya is also a great person but in generally in the in the vedic tradition when one particular deity is to be glorified the emphasis is on that and the actions of that deity that does not mean the other deity is inferior it just means in that story a particular moral is brought from a particular analytical perspective so lord ganesh shows how his priorities are clear and that's what we all need to do also let our priorities be determined by our convictions you know what is important for me not what the world considers important as that matters but in the hierarchy of priority what the world considers important is not as important as what is actually important for me so there are matters that matter more than matter <laughs> matter refers here to material things in the past material things could refer to the kind of gadgets and cars and homes that we have but nowadays material things refers to quite often to how many social media followers we have how many likes when we put our photo on instagram or facebook how many likes it gets sometimes you know the things can become so so dicey there's so much insecurity that our self worth is determined by our social media following which is which is a very tragic way of determining our self worth so there are matters that matter more than matter and the bhagavad gita begins with this very point and arjuna's question at the start of the gita is what really matters in life he is a warrior and he has the ability to fight and win the war and win the kingdom but he feels is this really worth it so he says that uh, in this verse he asks prachami tvam dharma sammudha chetah i ask dharma dharma is not just religion or duty it means the right thing to do what is it that will make my life meaningful the next verse he says after this na hi prapashyami mama panudyad yachokam uchoshanam indriyanam avapya bhuma vasaptanam ruddham rajyam suranam api cha dipatyam this is like the life or society has set a career path for me and that path is as a warrior i fight battles and i win battles and i gain glory but he says right now i don't think that really matters for me the sense of meaninglessness that is consuming me from within will not be removed merely by some achievements therefore i need to know what makes life meaningful and it is the answer to this question that is explored by the gita and that is what is demonstrated in the uh, in the epic stories of our tradition vedic tradition so ultimately we have various so there is the world of achievements there is the world of relationships and among our various relationships the the broad dharmic tradition say that the most important relationship is our relationship with the divine and in that relationship that becomes like the anchor it stabilizes us and all other relationships can then be oriented around 
balanced by that relationship. So that's the second point. So I'm discussing four R's. What are the first R anyone remembers? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. So put the past behind. You know, don't maintain your good intentions. Don't resent others' bad actions. The second R was? Relationships. relationships. Thank you. The world of relationships matters more than the world of achievements. Thank you. Let's look at the third R. So respect. Now, Lord Ganesh was a powerful being. He is known as Vignanashak, Vinayak. He is a person who is worshipped by everyone. Because everyone faces challenges when you try to begin something. And he is a person who can remove challenges. And although he is such a powerful being, he chose a relatively neglected and seemingly negligible being as his personal carrier. His car the, you know, different creatures have different carriers. Who is the carrier of Vishnu? Karuda is an imposing, is considered something the king of birds, an imposing, powerful bird. Who is the ca carrier of Shiva? Nandi. 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 That's a bull. Now, generally, among Wild animals, a lion or Mrugana, Mrugendro, a lion or tiger are considered very powerful. Among domestic animals, bulls are considered very powerful. Bulls, many warriors are considered comparable to Rishabhadev or to Bharata Rishabha. Rishabha is like a bull. They are as powerful as a bull. And that's why in some cultures, bull fighting. Matadors are considered heroic because bulls are very difficult to contain. So, Bull is considered a powerful, powerful being. So, different beings, different deities have various illustrious animals as their carriers. But Lord, Sh but Ganesh, he chooses a mouse. And even from ordinary perspective, if somebody says, "I have a pet," what is your pet? A mouse. Really? Okay. Most people say you couldn't find a dog or a cat or something. Or why, why a mouse? So whether we consider traditional perspective or contemporary perspective, a mouse is not considered a very significant, special or significant creature. And there are many times when people, but even other celestial beings, saw Ganesh on a carrier of a mouse, they would laugh at him. But Ganesh had a deeper purpose in mind. So generally when we relate with people, if we know that somebody is an important person, then we are naturally respect, respectful toward that person. You know, if we are in university and we know somebody is our fact professor, or somebody is the dean of the university, or somebody is a student leader in a group that we want to join, then we are respectful to that person. Or at least, at least we should be respectful, otherwise we'll get into trouble. So when we respect someone who is already respected by the world, well, that shows that we have some intelligence, isn't it? If somebody displays respect a person who is powerful, well, they'll get into trouble. It? So, it shows our intelligence. But, if we really want to know the character of a person, you know, we have to see how do they treat someone who is not very respected by the world. How that person treats ordinary people. That shows the character of a person. So, Lord Ganesh, by choosing a mouse as a carrier, teaches us this principle that don't respect others just because the world respects them, but rather respect others so that the world will respect them. You know, when we treat somebody politely, when we treat somebody kindly, you know, if we live in a culture where people who are below us are just treated like, like like slaves, serve slaves, servants, they're dismissed. And then we pay attention, we treat them at least as human beings. Others notice, oh really, yeah, maybe I should also treat like this. So treat others with respect so that the world respects them. Now we may say that, hey, oh, if the way I treat others, that's not going to have, change the world. Will it? Well, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know how much our actions influence others. We are very highly social creatures. And if we set a positive example, then that positive example can have a multiplier effect. 
So we don't have to do big sacrifices. It could just be simple as whoever we meet, just have a smile, have a kind word, and be polite. So that Lord Ganesh, by choosing an insignificant seeming creature as his carrier, shows that everybody deserves respect. And rather than thinking, so this is actually we could say a difference that shapes our relationships for a long time in future. Whenever we interact with someone, every relationship there is a reciprocity in it. That we we do something for the other person, that other person does something for us. But in general, for a relationship to be healthy, our focus needs to be: What can I do for this person? If our focus is what can this person be, do for me, then we will have a very utilitarian kind of relationship. It won't be very deep. It won't be very lasting. So respecting others is a vital part of a person's character. Respecting those who may not even be noticed or respected by the world, and this is what is actually fostered by the spiritual tradition. in which lord ganesh is a prominent figure the broad um, dharmic tradition see, is spiritually inclusive is spiritually inclusive so it says that every one of us is essentially equal many of you may know this verse from the bhagavad gita 518 it says vidya vinaya sampanne brahmane gavi hastini shunichaiva shwapake cha panditah samadarshinah that it says that panditah a wise person samadarshinah sees all living beings equally every single living being and this extends not just to all human beings all hum- not just all human beings but all living beings somehow the indian tradition especially in the western world has been defined by the caste system yes the caste system was there it's an unfortunate perversion of what was traditionally more a division of labor than a discrimination against people more it was meant to be a social division of labor but even then the focus of the division of labor was cooperation it was not discrimination but the point is at least within the philosophy of the tradition there are resources which pointed out that every living being is a part of the divine every living being is spiritually similar to every other living being and that's why there are stories of great saints who have respected even people who were from what are considered traditionally lower caste what to speak of respecting people from lower caste there are people now i don't even like to use the word lower caste because these are more functional divisions the the, the point was not so much a hierarchy as cooperation there are four different uh, social divisions and people from various divisions if we elevate it to the level of saints and if you see this inclusivity extended not just to all of humanity but to all the living beings and that is why now in our tradition it is that even in the celestial abodes it's not just about human beings it's about all kinds of living beings are there why because we see all living beings as spiritual in the catholic tradition uh, the, the pope was asked that the, in the, the, their idea is that it's a very with all due respect to christianity it's it's largely anthropomorphic anthropomorphic means that it's centered on human be- human beings at the center of the universe and jesus descends to deliver all human beings and now this is not necessarily the intrinsic teaching of the tradition but sometimes it becomes that way so animal the animal world and the plant world is seen primarily as a backdrop for the central drama of human redemption so the pope was asked recently that you know what happens to my pet if i have a pet dog or a pet cat you know i will go back to jesus what will happen to my pet dog or pet cat he said so this person said i love my pet dog if i my dog is not going with me to heaven i don't want to go to heaven <laughs> so the pope of the cuff he said yeah you know if a christian is devoted to jesus and their pet is devoted to the christian then the pet will also go to heaven and then there were some christians some conservative christians says what is the theological basis for this 
where is it said in the teachings of Jesus that your pet will go to heaven? <laughs> and that became a big theological debate. So, the point is that the level of spiritual inclusivity that is there in the Vedic tradition is extraordinary. And now veganism has become highly popular, highly influential, and people for ethical treatment of animals, and they are also quite active. So, if you look at their history and their roots, the ethos of ahimsa has come from the Vedic tradition. So, this ethos of ahimsa is not just a new modern trend, it has grounding in the Vedic tradition itself. And it's not just Lord Ganesh. We see that when Lord Ramachandra, when he wanted to form an army, whom did he choose for his army? Vanaras. So, Vanaras might be a slightly distinct species from our modern monkeys, but still they are similar to monkeys. So, again, uh, it's, some people say in that tradition only cows are worshipped. Well, cows are venerated, not exactly worshipped. It's a different thing, but it's not just cows, all living beings. So, monkeys, Vanaras were, were Lord Ram's army, and Lord Ram had personal relationship with them. The same with Krishna, Krishna and Vrindavan played with monkeys. So it's a spiritually inclusive worldview, not just in philosophy, but also in the actions of its venerated characters. And that brings me to the last point. So, so what is the third point we're discussing? Respect. respect. Thank you. The last part we'll discuss now is responsibility. So, Lord, uh, when at the start of this age, Kali Yuga, what happened was Vyasadeva saw that the wisdom which was, had been passed down through oral tradition for a long time needed to be written down. And he had a stupendous reservoir of wisdom. But how do we write it down? It would take a huge effort. So he meditated and he felt that Ganesh, Ganesh would be the perfect person to write it down. But he said that this is not wisdom that I own. I am not the source of the wisdom, I am the channel for the wisdom. And once it starts flowing through me, I cannot contain the flow. If the flow is broken, then we may lose that thought. So, the condition he said is that, once we start writing, we cannot stop. So, Lord Ganesh said, fine. He started writing. See, when he was writing, specifically the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata is a huge book. It is 110,000 verses. And 110,000 verses means literally that in the, in the Western tradition, Iliad and Odyssey are considered to be the longest poems. But the Mahabharata is seven times bigger than Iliad and Odyssey combined together. It's huge. So when Lord Ganesh started writing, writing he had, he had a, a belief and he was writing with a marker kind of pen. So he was writing, writing, writing. And as he was writing, what happened is this, his writing device, his pen broke. And now the condition was he can't stop. And Vyasdev was dictating. So what to do? He just took out his tusk. And the tusk is a part of the body. Taking it out is, his nose was bleeding. Took out the tusk and used the tusk for containing, making markings or leaf. And he kept writing. And that's why he is Ekadanta, known as having only one task. That one task was a part of his own body that he sacrificed for his cause. And while this is an extraordinary level of sacrifice, which you feel, I can't do that. But the, it's there's a principle which is universal over there. That when we take the responsibility to do something meaningful, something that is important for us, something that is that calls to something deep within us. When we take the responsibility for that. Oh. So when we take the responsibility to do something meaningful, what happens is we discover a sense of purpose. And that sense of purpose can raise us above our personal pleasures and pains. In general, if we don't have that sense of purpose, then even small things small problems start becoming unbearable. You know, say somebody is, uh, one of my friends is right now in Ukraine, and they're doing some relief work over there. 
as a part of our spiritual movement. So he's from America, he's gone there. He's risking his life. It's sometimes it's cold, it's they're hungry. But, so, but he is there and he is completely absorbed in it. And uh, well, the purpose is there. At first, okay, the, I may not eat food at the right time. I may not have the right comfortable place to live. It doesn't matter. But when we don't have a sense of purpose, then uh, if our purpose becomes pleasure, the purpose of my life is to have a problem-free life, to have perfect enjoyment in my life. Then what happens? Even the smallest of problems, they become very big. The smallest of problems. You know, we may be in a comfortable house. If our, if our dream in life is, I want to have perfect pleasure. Then when we are in our house, and if we are in our house, with that aim, I want the perfect house, the perfect pleasure. Then, even if the AC temperature is one degree lesser and high or higher than what we want. You know, maybe we have a spouse or some of the family members who are slightly lower temperature, we want slightly higher temperature. That can become a cause of fighting for us. So, the Gita says this world is Dukkhalaya. Dukkhalaya, it is not a pessimistic statement that this world is a place of distress. I started by saying that one truth we can all agree on is life is tough. So, what it means is, that if we try to make removing problems from our life, the purpose of our life, or if we try finding pleasure as the purpose of our life, we will increase the trouble in our life. Because if our purpose is to find pleasure, then every small problem will represent the frustration of our purpose, the defeat of our purpose. But if we understand that life is not meant only for gaining pleasure or avoiding trouble. Life is meant for doing something meaningful. When we focus on that, then our problems, our troubles and even our pleasures will be seen in perspective. And that is what Ganesh represents. When he offers his own task for the purpose of writing the Mahabharata, he is not feeling pain, oh I lost my task. He's actually feeling a sense of fulfillment. I'm doing something meaningful. And that raises him above his per above that pain that he may be facing because of the loss of the task. So all of us, we need to find, let's whatever I am doing right now, let me take responsibility to do something meaningful. So we study, if we are students, not just so that we can have a great job and earn a lot and have a great life, we study. So that with the knowledge that we get, we do something meaningful. We try to play our part in creating a better world. The Gita says, Swakarmanatam Abhyarcha. Work in a mode of worship. Sometimes it's translated as work as worship. That is an oversimplification. All work is not intrinsically worship. Somebody says, I am a thief, so robbing is worship. <laughs> uh, that won't work. So it means work when it is done in a mood of service, in a mood of contribution, then it can become a form of worship. So when we focus on doing something meaningful with the abilities that we have, and not, we don't have to wait to have some mystical revelation to find some meaning in our life. Right now what I'm doing, how can I do it in a more meaningful way? If I'm studying, maybe if I'm good at a particular subject, let me help somebody who's not so good in that subject. Do something bigger than ourselves. When we start with that, when we, if we become a part of a spiritual community, a spiritual group, then we may have resources that can help others when they are facing some depression, when they are facing some negativity. We can help them provide some positivity. And in that way, we can actually move forward in our life. So, the Bhagavad Gita talks about this principle, this is the last point I'll make, that and the best things in life, they don't in the beginning appear as the best things. The fulfilling things are often demanding at the beginning. The Bhagavad Gita talks about it in terms of poison and nectar. He says, Pariname amritopamam tatsukham satvikam proktam atma buddhi prasadajam. It says, Atat agre vishamiva. 
initially there are things which will taste like poison no we all may want to just enjoy and have a good life yeah it's fine but if we still have to study or take responsibility do something valuable in our life there may not be immediate difference that we seem to be making there may not be some immediate titillation that is coming it can seem like poison i am turning away from so many things which could give me immediate enjoyment but if we go through that poison eventually we'll get nectar we may lose a little bit pleasure but the fulfillment that comes from having a purposeful and meaningful life that is far greater and so tat sukham satvikam proktam this is elevated happiness a satvik happiness and atma buddhi prasadajam what it does is it uh, it gives us atma buddhi it gives us greater self understanding it takes us towards greater self awareness and ultimately it leads us to self actualization that we fulfill all our potentials materially and spiritually and that is what is demonstrated by lord ganesh that when we sacrifice immediate pleasure for a higher purpose that is what fills our life with meaning and purpose and that sacrifice begins doesn't have to begin something spectacular it can begin with simply taking responsibility for doing something meaningful right now so let's all pray to lord ganesh that through his example he has taught so many valuable lessons to us that we can internalize the lessons of prioritizing relationships seeking reconciliation learning to respect everyone and taking responsibility to do meaningful things thank you very much hare krishna